time in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Shake hands with two or three and welcome them tonight. Tell them it's good to see them out. Amen. All right, let me make mention of just a couple of things really, really quick here is before we get into this lesson tonight. Uh, of course, uh, two weeks, no, not two weeks, actually one week from tonight, uh, we will have going on in the classroom across from the coffee corner another membership orientation. Mike is going to do a Wednesday night class for some that were not able to get here on the Sunday morning. So if you are interested in membership, we'd love to have you in that class. And that one will be at, while this teaching is going on in here, that will be going on at the same time over there. And again, that's next Wednesday. And Mike, the sign-up is out there. If you have any questions, see Mike, and he'll be happy to sign you up. Is that right, Mike? Amen. So keep that in mind. We've had, I'm telling you, God has just been working wonderfully. We uh, took in 18 new members uh, two weeks ago. We baptized six on Sunday, and uh, it's just awesome to see what the Lord is doing. Are you excited about what God is doing at Grace? Amen. So uh, it is an exciting season, so get plugged in, get involved. Also, out there, uh, we still have sign up for altar workers and I need to expand my altar team on Sunday morning and different times so that we're prepared to pray for those coming in. And if you'd like to serve in that capacity, that sheet is out there. Now, some of you had signed up on the original sheet and something happened to it. And so the second sheet is out there. You might want to make sure if you had put your name on the first one, make sure it's on there, on the new one, or... Uh, we're, we're going to have the date and time of the meeting in the bulletin this week. Is that right, Pam? And I believe it's two weeks from tonight at 6.15 is what we've got that scheduled for in the classroom back there. So uh, before the service begins. So keep that in mind. All right. We're glad to see you out tonight. Let's, uh, we're going to look tonight at 2 Timothy chapter 3 beginning with verse 14. We'll look at it in just a moment. But we are going to do a two-part series uh, this week and next week. And uh, this one is entitled, Fully Developed. How many of you believe it's God's will for you to be fully, completely developed? And so we're going to be talking about that. And then we'll be off one Wednesday night for spring break. And then when we come back, which will be the 10th of April, we will begin the 2019 Healing School. And so I'm encouraging everybody to do their best to be part of that teaching on Wednesday nights because at some point you will need it. Now, the reason I'm dealing with this series entitled Fully Developed, uh, when I got saved, I was in one of those churches that had a lot of emphasis on getting saved. And uh, the church I grew up in emphasized a few things. We emphasized you need to get saved. We emphasized the need to pray, and we emphasized the need to be a soul winner. And all of those are great. But I got to thinking about it this week. That's just about where we ended things because we were not a Pentecostal or Spirit-filled church, so we didn't emphasize the supernatural. We never talked about the baptism in the Holy Spirit. We never talked about healings. We never talked about miracles we talked a lot about sickness and disease, <laughs> but we never talked a lot about the supernatural. And so we were developed in a saving faith, and it got us saved. But we were not developed any further. And I found out <clears throat> there's a whole lot of things that God wants to do once I get saved. How many are glad of that? See, it's not get you saved, and then you just live your life down here as things are and then get to heaven. That right there is, is a lot of people's mentality or spirituality. It is get me saved, now I'm ready for heaven, that's it. But I've got news for you. God intended for you to have much, much more than that. He intended to become part of your life. In fact, you got a brand new life. 
And we didn't get a hold of development in those areas that we needed to develop in so that we could walk life out victoriously. So I'm not going to be able to develop you in two weeks, but I am going to be able to sow a seed to tell you that you need to be developed. Everybody say, I need development. development. Amen. And see, you need it in more than one area because, you know, it's good if all you ever knew was to get saved. Thank God you got that. Thank God you were developed in saving faith. But I'm telling you right now, there's going to be some battles and uh, you're going to need some development in the area of healing. You need some development in the area of joy and peace. How many have ever found yourself in a situation where you had a lack of peace? Well, you need development, how to have peace. Uh, Finances. Did you ever have a financial battle? Well, you need development in the financial scriptures and how to flow in the blessing of the Lord in your finances. Um, And the list goes on. It is a very broad list. We'll talk more about it. But this thing of being developed, I want to start with a passage here that Paul spoke to Timothy, and uh, he was training Timothy as a young minister. And this is what he said in verse 14. Continue thou in the things thou hast learned and has been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them, and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. Now listen to verse 16. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. Well, say this right now. Say all scripture is given by the Lord, and it is profitable. Profitable is good, isn't it? So all Scripture is given by inspiration of God, and it is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Verse 17, very important verse. That the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly perfect, Furnished unto all good works. Now, you could say the man of God or you could say the woman of God, the person of God, the people of God. But Scripture is given to us so that we might be thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Everybody say thoroughly furnished. furnished. All right. Uh, Some of the other versions uh, say this. They say that so you'll be complete. How many believes the Lord wants you to be complete? Uh, Another one said, fitted for all good works. I like this. Fully qualified and equipped. Amen. And this was not just applicable to Timothy as a minister. This is to the people of God, all inclusive. So if you are a child of God, the will of God is that you get a hold of the word of God that is profitable in your life. And what it will do for you, it will cause you to become complete. It will cause you to become thoroughly furnished unto all good works. And it means you will lack nothing. And another way of saying this is you will become fully developed. Everybody say fully developed. developed. All right. Well, I thought I I want to dig a little deeper in that. So I'm going to dig just a little bit tonight and show you this. If you look this up, a definition of fully developed, this is what you'll find. Meeting all of the necessary requirements to be something. So if you're fully developed in something, then you meet all of the necessary requirements to be that something. Does that make sense? For instance, if a person is going to go to uh, to school, well, let's say a person uh, is going to be a doctor. You want them to go to school. Amen. You remember I, I shared on a Sunday morning, you don't want a surgeon, you know, who, who did all of his training online. And, and, and he says, I've read every book on the subject of the surgery you need. And I've studied everything I can find online. But I've never done one surgery. How many knows you could say, God bless you, but I don't want to be the first. He's not fully developed. 
You understand what I'm saying? So to be fully developed in something means you have met certain requirements that had to be met to declare you being fully developed. We could also say it means to be total. It means having come to a complete status. Necessary educational requirements met. Necessary experience and training met. Now you could be declared to be fully developed. Now that doesn't mean you don't learn anymore. So let's make sure we understand. We're not saying you arrive, because I can tell you right now, in, in the kingdom of God, you never get it all till you get to heaven. And you know what? When we get to heaven, you know, I believe we're going to know. We truly can know it all then. But somebody said that God being like he is, he may just show us great things from the first day we get there throughout all of eternity that we didn't know. I don't know. But when we talk about being fully developed, it doesn't mean we stop learning, but there is a place you come to where you're developed in things. All right? Now, the thing about development is this. It doesn't occur overnight. Have you ever seen an overnight genius? Well, maybe I better rephrase that. Somebody who thinks they arrived overnight. Our world is full of them. <laughs> Think they got it all, just suddenly, quickly, total experience in all of it, you know. Well, to be developed is a process. Everybody say development is a process. So I thought, well, I want to look up and see exactly what the definition of develop would be, and this is what I found. It means to grow or cause to grow and to become mature or advanced. I want to tell you what, if you'll sit in these classes, you're going to become mature. And I believe you're going to become advanced in faith. Amen. It also means to bring out the capabilities or the possibilities of or to bring to a more advanced or effective state. So this is what we would say about that. The more developed you become, the more effective you become. All right? That's why uh, when you might look for a, anything from an auto mechanic to a doctor, a financial advisor, or whoever it would be, the more they have practiced it the more they have worked in that field and the more they have uh, performed in that particular task, the more developed they are and the more you can trust them. Because we say it like this, they know what they're doing. Amen? And, and, and I mean, you go out, you're going to build a house and you go get somebody that's never built anything. You're going to get somebody to build your house and they've never built a dog house. How many knows things probably are not going to turn out right? So what are you going to do? You're going to look for somebody who's built some houses, who's had some experience. They've developed over time to know sometimes through trial and error what will work and what will not work. And it can save you a bundle of money and a whole lot of headaches. Say amen to that. Amen. All right. So on our spiritual journey then you get saved. That's first base. Then you should become disciple. Now, we use that word a lot in the church. I don't even know. That a lot of people know what it means. But discipled and being discipled or discipleship just basically means you begin to become developed in training and in teaching to know how to function in the new life you've received in Christ. See, for years we just get people saved and say, go to it, brother. And we never trained them in how to pray. We never taught them about giving, how to give, why you give. We never taught them about serving. And uh, we never taught them about faith and how to receive from the Lord. And so you got a whole group of people called the church who got to saving base, first base, but they never were truly discipled. They did not become developed. And as a result, there's weakness 
As a result, there's a lot of lost battles. A, a lot of them give up, throw in the towel. That's not how it's supposed to be. Say amen to that. Amen. All right? Because the church is supposed to be powerful. You're, you, if you're saved, you are the church. Everybody's saved in here, say, I'm the, I'm the church. Well, let me tell you something. You are the most powerful group of people on this planet. You're more powerful, much more powerful than that group out there in Washington. See, I want to say something there, and it's, I have to take time to find out if it's the flesh, Tommy, or if it's the spirit, you know. <laughs> what I wanted to say, and Tommy said, I wanted to say we're much more powerful than the group in Washington and a whole lot smarter appears sometimes. Amen. But we do have the wisdom of God. Amen. We do. We have the mind of Christ. And that gives us wisdom in certain things. But you are the most powerful group of people on the planet. You've been given power and authority. We've taught on that. You've been given delegated authority. You've been given the name of Jesus. You've got angels not only encamped around you, but they are ministering spirits, the Bible says, on your behalf. There's all kinds of things. You've got a covenant that this world doesn't have. You've got precious promises of God to see you through every situation. The world doesn't have that. You are the most influential group of people on this planet, yet the church sits by not even knowing what they're supposed to be doing. Why? They're not fully developed. And so things happen in life. Battles come. In every form, and because we've not been developed in all these areas, battles are lost. And one of the reasons why I wanted to do this series this week and next week is I want you to understand the necessity of being developed. And not just being developed, I want you to become well-rounded in development. I don't know any other better way to say it. I want you to get developed in faith. Peace, healing and health, spiritual things, finances. I want you to get the whole thing working together in your life so you are so developed that whatever battle shows up, regardless of what it is, you're ready for it. Shout, I'm ready. I'm ready. Amen. All right. So full development is God's will for our life. And maturity is his plan. And, uh, you know, we need to be like Caleb and Joshua. We need to say we are well able to take the land because we're developed in our faith. Now, let me move forward tonight. This is what we're going to deal with in this. How do you do it? How do you become developed? And I was thinking about this. Where do you start? Well, we always seem to end up going this, in this direction. How do you start to become developed in every area you need to be developed in so you're ready for whatever the enemy throws your way or whatever life tosses at you? You've got to develop on the foundation of the Word of God. Somebody say, oh, Pastor, can't you tell us anything? <laughs> I mean, if you're preaching on healing, you tell us, get to the Word. If you're preaching on depression, you need the word. If you're preaching on strength, well, you just need the word. <laughs> if you need help in your marriage, well, you know what you all need. You really need to get in the word here. If you need help, you know, in finding peace and joy, well, you really need to get in the word. But it's the foundation. Everybody say, the word is the foundation. The word is the foundation. And so this is what, I, I, what just rose up in me while I was preparing this this week. You can't develop without the Word. It's impossible. So you start with the foundation of the Word of God. Your foundation cannot be Grandma's foundation. Now, if, it's, if hers is the Word of God, all right. But there's a whole lot of people who's trying to live on Grandma's tradition. That ain't the foundation. Grandma might have been a great, wonderful Grandma, and grandpa might have been the greatest grandpa in the world, but you can't build your experience with God on their experiences. You've got to have your own foundation settled 
And it's got to be in God's word, not their word. Amen. All right? It's not on a song. <laughs> I hear people sometimes say, well, you know the old song says. That's wonderful. But, but that can't be the foundation. All right? Uh, it's not on just what I have heard said in church. What I heard said by a preacher. Listen, this preacher tells you on a regular basis, go <laughs> to the book and read it for yourself. Amen. Do y'all remember hearing that in this church? That's so important. Because it's not enough for you to say, well, preacher so-and-so said. Yeah, but did you look it up in the covenant? All right, we're talking about being fully developed. All right, so the word is the foundation for absolutely everything in your life. And so to be fully developed, you're going to have to start the foundation of the word. And that foundation is broad. And what I mean by that is, if all you ever heard was Jesus saves, that might have been enough to get you saved, but you better go a little further than that. Go just a little further than that. All right? Let's look at Hebrews 1, verse uh, 1 through 3. Hebrews 1, verse 1 through 3. I'm actually reading this in the NIV. That's, that's what she's put up. So let's read it. It says, in the past... God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed heir of all things, and through whom also he made the universe. I mean, this says God made the universe through his son. Look at verse 3. The son is the radiance of God's glory, and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word, after he had provided purification for sins, he has sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. Now, the King James Version says, he upholds everything by the word of his power. Well, he upholds and he sustains. Can you see that? So he's upholding all things by the word of his power. Or the NIV means the same thing. He's sustaining all things through his powerful word. Sustain means to uphold or to cause to continue. I like that because that means to sustain you means when you're in a battle, whatever that battle is, they're sustaining continuing power released in the word so that you continue. All right, I don't think I'm there yet. We're going to get there in just a minute. I want you to see that because it's so important and I'm going to bring it down on, on a personal level. When I was diagnosed with a disease that had potential to keep me from continuing, y'all see what I'm saying? There are some things that don't have that potential. If all you got's a cold, it's probably going to last, you know, 10 days or so, and you're going to get over it, but it's probably not going to kill you. But there, there's cancers and tumors and other diseases that have the power to take you out. But there is sustaining power in the word of God for whatever battle you're in so that instead of discontinuing, you continue through and make it to the other side. Somebody ought to shout amen right there. You know, it's kind of like the, the three Hebrew boys went in the fire, but glory to God, they came out of the fire, sustained through it. Daniel slept with the lines and made a line into a pillow, sustained. What does that mean for Daniel? It means he wasn't eaten. 
If he had been eaten, Daniel would have been discontinued that night. But because of the sustaining power of God, he continued to live and preach the next day. Do you see what I'm saying? So sustaining power is very important, and everything is being sustained by his powerful word. So as we are developing in every area of our faith, every area of our spiritual life, we, we develop in the word of God because that's where sustaining power is released that will cause you to be able to continue in life, continue through the trial, overcome the obstacle, and make it all the way through to the end, and we are going to make it. Everybody make a good confession right now. Say, I am going to make it. Amen. So, to develop, you need to know what the Word says in any area. If I'm going to develop in healing, I need to know what the Word says about healing. If I'm going to develop about finances, I need to know what the Word says about finances, and I also need to know what the Word says about giving. That's why when I received the offering on Sundays, for several years I would get up and I'd, I'd say little cliches, you know, we're going to worship the Lord in giving now. And the ushers would come and we'd receive the offering. Now, I wasn't one of those that would get up and say, and I've heard this said, but I never was one of those guilty of getting up and saying, we're going to get the offering out of the way tonight. Because <laughs> I never felt like it was in the way. It's spiritual. But back about four or five years ago, I began to take about five minutes, just like I do now, and I would talk about what the Word says, not what I say. I wouldn't spend five minutes begging and pleading and manipulating an offering. Just opening the book, just like I did Sunday. And every week, pretty much, every now and then I'll give another illustration or example, but most of the time I'll just open the book and read to you something about what the Word says about giving. What am I doing? I'm developing your faith in giving. We're developing it. All right? So what we noticed was, and many of the men on my board commented about it, was giving changed when we started developing in giving. When we started knowing why we're giving. And we started developing faith in giving. Giving in this church began to change. The other thing that I, I started doing, we started making a confession over that offering rather than just praying over it. Now, there's nothing wrong with praying over an offering. But the reason I started having this church declare and proclaim, and it is scriptural. We, I've, I've showed you many times back there in the Old Testament when they brought their tithe and brought their offering, they were to say something, and it tells specifically in the Old Testament what they were supposed to be saying when they brought it. Maybe I need to do that again Sunday. <laughs> All right, so I would have you say, Today, in obedience to the word, we're, we, we bring our tithe. We bring our offerings. Therefore, I qualify for the blessings proclaimed in Scripture. I was thinking about this today, and I thought, you know, I really need to add something else to that. Because we say that pretty much every week. I qualify. Well, as you're declaring that, you're declaring what the Word says. Windows of heaven are poured out. Blessings are poured. Windows of heaven are open. Blessings are poured out upon me. There's not room enough to receive it. And the devourer is rebuked for my sake. That comes straight out of Malachi chapter 3, verse 10. What are we doing when we say that together? We are developing our faith in that giving and our faith in receiving the blessing proclaimed on it. The Lord said, you also need to be saying, and I receive it. I receive what's coming out of those windows of heaven. Amen. See, it's development in giving. Development in faith. You need more love, you can develop in it. You have a lot of unforgiveness, you need to develop in forgiveness. Somebody said, how do you do that? Well, it won't take you too long to find an enemy. <laughs> It won't take you too long to find somebody you need to forgive. So find somebody you need to forgive and just start declaring, Lord, I forgive them and call them by name. And, and if the Lord leads you, you might have to call them up and tell them you're releasing them or forgiving them of something. But forgiveness starts by faith. Are you all here? So development. 
development. Another thing we need to develop in is patience and endurance because if you have no patience and no endurance, you can't last through one battle. It's amazing. I see people come to church sometimes. Oh, I mean, they're the most spiritual people in the house. And I've watched this over the years. Sometimes, sometimes it can be the loudest amen in the house. And all of a sudden, one trial, something hits them and my Lord, you don't see them anymore. It just knocked them off their feet and they're gone forever. You just don't see them anymore. Well, something in their endurance and patience was not developed. Because you've got to endure in the trial. means you've got to have this sustaining power to see you through the trial and keep you on top while you're going through the mess that's out there. And how many have found out there's a lot of messes out there? And if the devil can take you out with a mess, trust me, he is a master at creating messes. But if he can figure out that you're going to endure and you've been developed in endurance and patience, he can't do anything with you. This is not in my notes. We're going to leave them for just a minute. But, Georgie, we're going to look at James at that, those first few verses because it's very important. James chapter 1, verse 2 James said, count it all joy when you fall into divers' temptations. And that word temptations doesn't just mean temptation to go out and sin. It actually doesn't mean that. It means trials, afflictions, trouble. Anybody had any trouble? <laughs> Nancy says a few times. She's had a few. <laughs> My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into divers' temptations, knowing this that the trying of your faith worketh patience. And that word patience is better translated from the original text as endurance. And this is why. Verse 3. Knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience, let patience or endurance have her complete work that you may be perfect or complete and entire wanting or lacking nothing. And I believe what the revelation in that is this. If you learn how to develop in patience and endurance, the devil, it doesn't matter what trial he throws, he knows you are developed in endurance and you'll endure. And that word endure does not mean to stand in there and just die. It means to stand in there and stand your ground and come out victorious on the other side just like the Hebrew boys came out of the fire. There's a scripture, I believe it's in Isaiah, talks about uh, you'll pass through the waters, they're not going to overflow you. You'll pass through the fire, and the fire won't burn you. That's biblical endurance. Everybody say, I'm going to win. Let's finish this up quick. See, God's word is his bond. You need to see that. Let's look at... Uh, a couple of verses here. Uh, Psalm 138, verse 2 in the NLT, part of that verse says, For your promises are backed by all the honor of your name. Uh, the King James uh, says he has honored his uh, word above his name, I believe is how it says it, but it means the same. His word, he has backed it up. By the power that's in his name. There is no greater name than the name of Jesus. And every promise is signed by Jesus. Lord have mercy. That's good. All right. And I just want to throw this out to you. We're talking about the importance of developing in this and developing in the word. These are just things that we know just came off the top of my head. Just from Things said in Scripture. For instance, parable of the sower. The sower soweth the word. What kind of seed you going to sow? The word. Faith comes by hearing. And hearing by the word of God. Faith comes through the word of God. Heaven and earth shall pass away. But my words will never pass away. What Jesus said. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. That's in the first chapter of John. Then, if you skip down a few verses, it says, The Word became flesh 
and dwelt among us. So we know Jesus was the living, breathing Word. How many can see the importance of the Word? All right, so the Word is our foundation. We're developed by what the Word of God says. And to be, to be developed, get this, make sure you catch this, to be developed in the Word is to be developed in your covenant. For you to be developed in your Word or in His Word is for you to be developed in your covenant. Now, what makes a great attorney is that that attorney is able to go in before a judge, a jury, whoever, and present a very strong, solid case. Would you all agree with that? If I have an attorney, I pray I never need one. But if I need one, I want one who knows how to present a solid case that's winnable. Well, how does he do that? He needs to be knowledgeable of the law and knowledgeable of other cases that he can pertain to as examples. But if he has no knowledge and he just goes in there and babbles, you all know what babbling is? I don't think I have to define that. I'm probably going to lose the case. For you to develop in the word, I see this, this, I just, that's not, this is not in my notes. I see this in the spirit. We need to become as skillful in our covenant, so developed in it, that when the accuser of the brethren, you all know who the accuser of the brethren is? Satan has any accusation against us or tries to bring something upon us, we can step out and we can say, hold on just a minute. I want to refer you over to what Brother Matthew said in chapter 3, verse 4, thus, 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 thus. I want to refer you over to what John said. Oh, I want to refer you to what the Apostle Paul wrote down in his letter to the church at Ephesus. We're so developed in it, the devil can't get any advantage on us whatsoever because every time he does, we're so developed, we just bring out what the Word says and the Word will win every time. Well, isn't that what Jesus did? When the devil showed up, what did what did Jesus do? He was so developed in his, oh my Lord, he was so developed in his father's word, he just stepped out and said, well, it is written. <laughs> well, it is written. You need to be so developed in your father's words, just like your big brother Jesus. When the devil shows up, yeah, but it is written. Now, you can't do that if you're not developed in it. Are y'all getting anything out of this? I'm getting blessed enough for all of us in teaching this up here. Amen. All right. So, we got to stop seeing this as a religious book, and we got to start seeing this as a covenant book or as our covenant, and we develop in this thing. I got to develop in knowing what my covenant says, I got to develop in knowing how to use my covenant. I got to develop in knowing how to use it, not just in church, but for daily living for whatever circumstance comes my way. And I need to develop in using this covenant to put my enemy to flight. And I can develop in that. And the more developed I become in that, the less the enemy can do with me. Do you all believe that? Let's bring this down and close it. In the Old Testament, one of the greatest examples, and we refer to this quite often when we talk about covenant, is the example of how David killed Goliath. And we, we've said in this class, David used a stone, but really he brought the giant down with covenant. Because when he looked out there and saw the giant, he said, Who is this? And he used the term uncircumcised, uncircumcised Philistine which is denoting he's not a covenant man with our God, so 
Who is he to defy the armies of God? David was developed in covenant. I don't know how he got there. I guess through meditation, prayer, and looking at what he had because he didn't have a Bible like you have. He didn't have nearly what we got to develop in. But he was developed into knowing he was a covenant guy. And he could bring a giant down with that covenant. And so with that in mind, one of the greatest chapters in the Psalms, and I'm going to encourage you to read it all this week, is the longest book in the Bible, Psalm 119. One of the long, well, it is the longest chapter, not book, in your Bible is Psalm 119, and it is rich. It is powerful. Uh, Psalm 119 has 176 verses. You all be able to read that this week. Surely you read that. Amen. Look at, uh, we're going to look at just one part of this and a couple of verses in closing. Psalm 119, verse 9 through 16. The psalmist, David, said this. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? How does he do it? By taking heed thereto according to thy word. With my whole heart have I sought thee. Oh, let me not wander from thy commandments. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Blessed art thou, O Lord, teach me thy statutes. With my lips I have declared all thy judgments of thy mouth. I have rejoiced in the way of thy testimonies as much as in all riches. I will meditate in thy precepts and have respect unto thy ways. I will delight myself in thy statutes. I will not forget thy word. Now, I put down out of that seven points here. She's going to throw them on the screen. David's keys to development. In, that listed there. And the first thing he said is, with my whole heart I've sought thee. All right, so David says, I'm not just partially seeking God. I'm putting my whole self into seeking the Lord. What would happen in your life if you were to give your whole heart in, in, out there seeking the will of God? All right, the second thing, he says, I have hid thy word in my heart you got to hide the word in your heart. How do you develop in this thing? you got to get it off of the pages into your heart. And let me just say this. It takes time to hide the word in your heart. I'm going to do a lesson somewhere this is coming out soon. I can tell you we, we need a coming soon marquee out here. Amen. But coming soon, we're going to talk greatly about this. There are many in the church world who have got down the mechanics. And what we mean by mechanically going through the motion they can mechanically quote the word, mechanically make confessions, mechanically do this, but they've never gotten it down into their heart. And then what happens is uh, a trial shows up, and because it's not fully developed in their heart, mechanics do not work well in the heat of the battle. And what I mean by that is the motions of things. Because if you've just been going through the motion while everything's going well, you can make good confessions all day long as, as long as everything's going well. But what are you going to say when all hell breaks loose? It's quiet in here. All right? So, got to hide that word in your heart, and that will take time. Third thing, I declare thy word with my mouth. Open your mouth. Remember, there were three things the Lord said to me that, that every believer should be doing every day of their life. You need the word going in your eyes, you need the word going in your ears, and you need the word coming out of your mouth. When it's in the heart, hitting your heart, from the abundance of the heart, the mouth will speak, so it will come out of the mouth. The psalmist said, I have declared your word with my mouth. Number four, I have rejoiced because of the testimonies in your word. There, when you get the word in your heart and you get it coming out of your mouth, you will not have any trouble praising God because your praise will be based on the word that's in your heart and coming out of your mouth. All right, number five, I meditate on your word. Meditate means giving time to thinking on the word, thinking on the promise, meditating on the promise, and the more you meditate on it, the more you see of it. 
Six, I delight in the word. Listen, there's a place the word becomes your delight. I realize that there is a time every person goes through. I have been there in my life when you just have to almost force yourself into that word. Well, I don't want to read it, but I'm going to have to spend time in it. I'm going to make myself spend time in it. There is a place you will come to where the enjoyment and delight in that word will be so powerful to you that you wouldn't think about doing your day without it. Take my word for it. I believe that to be true. Now, number seven, I will not forget your word. You will not take your eyes off of it to forget it. You will keep it alive in your heart. If you do all those things, you're developing. Say amen. amen. Uh, I'm going to skip these verses and just bring this to a close because there's some other verses in there, Georgie, that I gave you. But what we were saying is David developed in his covenant by developing in the Word of God. He said all these things about the Word of God. You read the rest of Psalm 119. They're there. I mean, it's over and over in there what the Word meant to David. So when David came up against a giant, it was already developed in here. How did he kill a lion? Same way, he had a covenant. How did he kill a bear? Same way, he had a covenant. But it was developed. It was fully developed in him so he could take on whatever came his way. Amen. Um, Let's read this, and I'm going to toss this to you and have you out of here in five minutes. Nobody amen that. <laughs> Ephesians 6, verse 10. Paul said, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Stand with your loins girt about with truth, having on the breastplate of righteousness, having your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. Take the helmet of salvation, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. Notice, if you're going to develop, you need to put on the whole armor. I'm going to give you something to think about. In that armor, Loins girt with the belt of truth, breastplate of righteousness, prepared with the good news of peace, your shield of faith, your helmet of salvation, your sword of the Spirit, which is the Word, and then praying always. Now, Sunday I'm going to be touching this too, so I want to be careful not combine tonight's message with Sunday. <laughs> but here's the thing. I was looking at these this, this week, and uh, we used to go through, some of y'all came out of churches where they used to daily you get up and put all that on yes. symbolically. Put my helmet on, put my breastplate. That's wonderful. But I want to give you a little deeper meaning of that. Because <laughs> you can go through what I just referred to as the mechanics of something. It's easy to teach people motions. I think what the Apostle Paul would, if he would have written a little further on that, he would have said, you need to be developed. In righteousness as your breastplate. You need to be developed in faith as your shield. You need to be fully developed in what salvation means as your helmet. And you need to be fully developed in the spirit, the sword of the spirit or the word as a weapon. You need to be developed in that. 
You need to be developed in all these areas and all these things. Because here's the thing. You could be developed in the helmet of salvation and not developed in anything else, and you'd be lacking. i got to drop that there. We're going to end up moving right straight into Sunday morning, and we can't do that tonight. See what we mean by being fully developed. All right. So we want to develop in this way. This is why this has come up in me this week. Um, I've, I've spent a lot of time developing in healing, and I still do. And if, if somebody comes up with something on healing, I got something to say. All right? But I may not be developed in another area. And so if something happens and I have a battle in that area, I don't have, maybe I don't have much to say. Do you understand? See what I'm, I'm saying? You need to work on developing in all these arenas so that whatever the enemy shows up with, you're developed in that faith to be able to release the sword against him. Amen. Did you receive anything tonight? Amen. Let's stand and uh, give the Lord a hand clap. <laughs> Amen. And uh, I'm going to ask you, listen. I want to ask you to bow your heads for just a moment. We're going to get ready to close. But, you know, this is, this is the foundational elements of how we walk in victory and how we, how we begin to see transition and change and where we move from losing battles to winning battles. And, uh, but I don't want to leave tonight. I want to I pause for just a minute. Maybe some are watching online. And if you're not saved or you, you need to recommit your life to Christ, you can do that right here on Wednesday night, right where we're standing in this auditorium. And this is what I want to do. I want to lead a prayer that I believe you can be saved by this simple prayer, or you can rededicate or recommit your life to the Lord Jesus by this simple prayer. And I want to lead you in this prayer tonight. I want you to pray it out loud, and I want you online watching right where you are. If you need to be saved or you need to recommit your life to Christ, we want you to pray with us this evening. Would you pray, church? Let's pray like this. Say, oh God, oh God. we come before you. We, come before you. we, recognize, you we recognize you as the only as one and true God. And tonight, we recognize that Jesus is the only way to get to heaven. And this night, we receive you, Jesus, as our personal Savior. We ask you to wash us, forgive us and cleanse us of all sin. Give us a new start, a brand new life, a brand new beginning. We ask for it in Jesus' name. And we receive it. Amen. Amen. If you were here tonight and you prayed that prayer and you got saved or you rededicated, would you just slip your hand up? Anybody tonight? Bless you, Tanner. Amen. Give the Lord praise. Anybody else? Back here. Amen. Praise the Lord. And you online, if you prayed that prayer, please send us a message and let us know tonight. Amen. We're proud of you, buddy. Happy for you. Amen. Amen. Well, we're going to dismiss this service tonight. There's somebody at the door to receive your offering. Mike, would you pray over the offering, and we'll see you on Sunday.